I said before um, about this uh, thoracolumbar lumbar injury classification severity score, or TLIX as we say it, uh, what this score does, or this grading scale does, is it looks at, um, it, it offers a essentially a guide for surgeons when you're looking at something, when you're looking at a, a patient's radiographic imaging, you're looking at their neurologic exam, it gives you an idea of what is the urgency of surgery or, or timing of surgery, okay? Does this patient need surgery or not? So there are three things that you look at, okay? Um, two of them can be obtained from the imaging itself, and one of them has to be obtained from the actual neurologic exam. So uh, what you look at here, and um, what you see in this slide is basically, you look at one, the integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex, or the PLC, and that comprise, is comprised of ligamentum flavum, facet capsule, um, intraspinous ligament and supraspinous ligament. And what that means is that if these are disrupted or suspected to be disrupted, that confers a higher degree of instability to the spine than if you know that they're intact. So things that are like fracture dislocations or distraction type injuries uh, often have involvement of the PLC. And as a result, those are technically unstable injuries. Um, other things that I look at are the morphology of uh, potentially compression fractures like burst or partial burst fractures. And last but not least, we look at uh, the patient's neurologic exam, whether they are neurologically intact, have an incomplete spinal cord injury, complete spinal cord injury, or things like cauda equina. These are all taken into account into the severity scale. And basically what it does is it says, you know, it's on a scale of, I forget the actual numbers itself, but um, higher numbers, uh, more points mean that this patient needs, will likely need surgical intervention. And lower points mean that this patient um, will can, you can potentially uh, wait and see or try conservative management. Um, another variant of the uh, TLEX, there are many different, let me put it this way, there are many different grading scales for uh, thoracolumbar injuries. And one of them is the AO spine criteria. And there are, we have more slides on this and we'll look at it as well too. So there's TLEX, which is more clinically oriented. And you have AO spine, which is more morphology oriented. Um, although there are more papers coming out to uh, suggest that certain morphology, trying to convert a clinical significance to the morphologies of the injuries. But this is what we use to kind of, um, to describe the injuries a little bit better. So you can have, broadly speaking, three different types of uh, uh, thoracolumbar type fractures on the AO spine criteria. You have type A, which are compression injuries, they're only the anterior column, um, very, and do, generally do not involve uh, a significant portion of the middle of column and do not involve the posterior column at all. And they have type B, which are distraction injuries, which by definition um, have to involve the posterior column or disruption of the posterior tension band. And type C, which are the uh, fracture dislocation type injuries, which are all, these, these are the worst of the worst. These, these type of injuries are always unstable and always need um, surgical intervention. So <clears throat> what this does is, as you can imagine, there are no, 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 two traumas are similar. Everyone's trauma is unique in some way, but what we try to do is we try to reduce some of the heterogeneity of um, the, the radiographic imaging of traumas, and we try to introduce homogeneity in the way we describe them, the way we do research on them, and the way that we, um, in the way that we treat them. So, <clears throat> so you know, it's, it's good to, and it's a good exercise, and I always would try to do this when I was describing um, let's say burst fractures or vertebral body uh, uh, compression type fractures uh, to my attendings, I would tell them it's an AO spine uh, type A3, for example, or uh, an AO spine type you know, B2 or something like that. And they would generally appreciate that because they knew exactly what I was talking about. And it shows that I, I took the time and the effort to look at the images and um, get an idea of what, uh, you know, what we were dealing with. So um, going back here, um, so we have uh, type A, uh, can I yeah, say sure. something real quick? Can you go back for a second? Yeah. This is our friend Carlton Watson asked a great question, and I just want to address it real quick because I tried to type it, but I can't listen and type at the same time. So I want to say it real quick. So he asked if, if you only do this at the initial injury or if you do it later to see if it's changed. And just a fundamental concept about this and the way we go through them and the way that the AO spine mm -hmm. tells you to go through this um, classification. When you're looking at the spine when they come in the ear after initial injury, you see the worst one first. Is it a translation? Is it already frankly unstable? Is there motion of one body on another such that there is cord injury can all compromise? <clears throat> if not, then you move down to B. Is there a distraction? Is there both, is there 
post your attention band or anterior attention band injury. A lot of times C by definition, actually a lot of times, all the time, C by definition will have component of B. C has to have B. It has to have either anterior or posterior tension band injury in order to move like that. <laughs> C will also likely have a component of A. It'll probably have some kind of a compression. Now, if you rule out C and you go to B, if you have anterior or posterior tension band injury, you obviously don't have a C and it's not going to move to a C, likely, unless you throw them off the table or something. They fall off the table. I don't know, whatever. But it might have an A. And if you're starting with an A, if it's only anterior column, if it's only involving the vertebral body itself, no tension bands, then it's not going to move to a B or a C, again, unless they fall off the table or something bad happens to them. So really, only, you only need to do this at the initial scan. You don't need to do this again. It's a classification to see where they go immediately, where you're triaging this person in terms of management. You agree with that, Rizzoli? Is that a good answer? Yeah. So you want to, uh, you want to, um, so, so for the telix and AO spine, you want to do it at the time of uh, when they arrive. The, the difference is, I think what you're referring to, Carlton, is the Asia scale. And uh, although we do do the Asia scale at the time of the injury, it's not technically correct. It, we generally should, the, the most accurate Asia uh, scale in terms of grading the severity of spinal cord injury, is somewhere between 48 and 72 hours after the injury. So that's how we get a better idea of what the patient's true Asia scale is. Now, this is more uh, a, 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 this, a clinical decision rules on whether or not you should, you can potentially conservatively manage this patient who comes in with, like I say, a type A2 type fracture uh, versus somebody who needs to go to the OR right away. So that's how, that's, you, you want to do AO spine and telix at the time of um, the scan. So this is why it's good that we're doing this together because I just learned something there too. Because when we're doing this, when this person comes in the ER, I'm reading that CT and I'm giving you one of those injuries. You're looking at it too, but supposedly I'm the one that's the expert on the CT, but I don't know anything about the age. I don't know anything about the patient. So there's right. more to it. So that's why it's good that we're, we're working these patients up all together as a team. Yeah, exactly. Totally agree. So um, going on to the different types of AO, this is now we're talking about AO spine criteria again. AO spine talks more about the morphology of the injury. That, that's the, the main uh, goal of the AO spine criteria um, with a secondary goal of guiding clinical decision making. Okay? It's not as well defined as TLEX. TLEX's goal is to decide whether or not this patient needs surgery or, you can cons or something indeterminate or whether you can maybe conservatively manage it. Okay? So TLEX for clinical, AO spine for morphology. So you can see here, it goes from A, there's an A0, which is basically insignificant type fractures. And then it goes from A1 to A4, and this generally confers the severity of a type of injury. However, these A2 type fractures, which is interesting, is these A2 type fractures are, <coughs> are um, highly unlikely to heal well, unlike oblique type fractures. These often need some sort of surgical intervention versus A3, which um, potentially based on uh, the patient's neurologic exam, their age, their, their degree of, um, you know, the bone quality, their health, you could potentially conservatively manage these. And then these A4s uh, tend to also need to be um, surgically managed. So it sees a little, there's a little bit of, it's not it's as straightforward as you would think. Um, oftentimes, uh, the best way to know whether or not a, a patient will need surgical intervention is getting, if they can tolerate it, a weight-bearing x-ray. And that's where the utility comes in, because you can see um, you know, you're not, when you're, someone's getting a CT or an, or an MRI, they're laying supine on a table and they're not in their true physiologic alignment when they're standing up. I mean, things can drastically change when someone's standing up. So the utility of x-ray is not for a patient to lay supine. The utility of the x-ray in this setting is to have them stand up and take a look. And I will say this again, if you have a patient admitted to your service with trauma and some sort of fracture to the spine, they cannot leave your service, unless they have an upright or a weight-bearing x-ray, okay, it's the most important scan they're going to get, more important than the CT or MRI, is, uh, is, is the, uh, a weight-bearing scan. So make sure every trauma patient has an upright or standing AP and lateral, lumbar, or if they have a cervical injury, cervical x-ray before they get discharged, okay? Super important. And if they have a collar, make sure they're in the collar when they get that x-ray, because then you know how that patient's likely going to heal if you decided to treat this patient conservatively. And in the case of a lumbar fracture, you want them to be in, a, let's say, an LSO or a TLSO. All right. 
So, um, okay. I, I don't can really I get into that. Go back for a second. Sure. Because I know there are people, and they're not just neurosurgery people here, there are radiology people here too. So just real quick about the way I tell people to look at this when we're looking at the fracture. So if we know it's anterior column only, these A-types, what I tell people to do, again, you're going from worst to least bad. You want to rule out the very worst thing first. So we would start with A4. So see if they have an A4. You look at the posterior cortex. Is the posterior cortex involved? If it is, you know it's three or four, so that's a burst, a complete burst or an incomplete burst. The next thing you look at is the end plates. So if it's just one end plate, that's incomplete, so that's A3, point A3, thank you. If it's both end plates, it's A4, which is a complete burst. Now that split fracture, that, I'm glad you said that, Rosalie, because I didn't know, I thought those were more severe, but I didn't know the significance of the healing, so that's interesting. Um, but despite that, the posterior cortex is intact. There's no chance of retropulsion of fragments into the canal. And then A, like you said, it's just a one end plate. We see those all the time. Um, probably not very significant and the least bad. But always go from the worst to the least. So look at that posterior cortex first. All right, now go yeah. on. Okay, so these are the type B on the AO spine um, classification scale. And as you can see, these, <clears throat> these involve, and generally they involve the posterior ligamentous complex, except for the type B3, which are, um, <clears throat> They involve the anterior middle and they're uh, uh, generally hyperextension type injuries. They're a little bit different. Um, so if you look here, this, this is a posterior osseous, osseous tension band or it can be pure ligamentous tension band, distraction type injury, or is it a chance type fracture where you have um, uh, a hyperflexion type injury over a fixed point anterior to the um, instantaneous axial rotation of the spine. So uh, what that could be is like, um, you are like on a, uh, let's say like a roller coaster and you have a bar holding you down and then it suddenly stops and you flex forward like this. Like this is, this is that type of, this is this type of injury, okay? Where you fall and you like, you fall on like a, like a, a fence or something. We, we once saw a patient that happened to, um, I won't tell you why that happened, but let's just say that uh, <laughs> he needed surgery. And then um, these are obviously more unstable. This involves essentially all three columns, as you can see. And this, these need surgery. With the hyperextension type injuries, what's unique about these is that these often, we see these um, in patients who have uh, ankylosing spondylitis, which we'll talk a little bit more about, for patients who have um, DISH or diffuse idiopathic uh, skeletal hyperostosis. And what happens here is, as we saw in that patient who had the laminectomy defect and the hyperextension injury with the disruption of the disc space, um, these patients, these are these are very scary injuries. They often are highly unstable. You generally need an MRI. And, um, and although they can sometimes look very, in this case, you can see they're very exaggerated. It's very obvious, but sometimes these can look very, very, uh, very, very subtle and they, they can be hard to find. Um, and although they're detectable on MRI, you may not easily see them on CT. And, uh, and once every couple of years, there's a patient who has like a very, uh, uh, a, say like a hyperextension type injury in a rigid spine that uh, is just so subtle that it's often missed and read as being intact. And then the patient has like some sort of horrible like uh, uh, iatrogenic uh, like hot, uh, spinal cord injury while they're in the hospital because no one knows that they're like grossly unstable and they try to get them out of bed and then boom. So um, one thing that we don't see here about point your I uh, 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 give you as a little bit of a pearl is in patients who have a hyperextension injury of the ALL or the disc space, sometimes what you can see are little um, gas bubbles or uh, little black dots at the ALL or inside the actual disc space itself. Um, and that can give you an idea, sometimes even in the spinal canal. And that can give you a little like, kind of, if you see something like that in a patient who has a rigid spine, meaning AS or DISH, you want to have a little bit higher in this of suspicion that something bad happened and you just want to, I would play it safe and get an MRI because the MRI will show you everything. Can I say something about that too? So sure. yeah, we have to be careful. You just said it. Sometimes these are so subtle because patients with ankylosing spondylitis especially are very osteoporotic and you cannot see, yes. you can't see anything and let alone a very subtle fracture. And it's vital that these are recognized by radiologists, all the radiology one <laughs> people who are going to be radiologists out there. Because these people, like I, when I worked at a county hospital, a lot of these people came in, we didn't know their history. They didn't even know their history. They didn't even know they had it. And if that is missed and they go to surgery or they're being moved, 
they can break very easily. They're very fragile. And even if they don't have a fracture, you can cause one or you can cause an additional one. Very common. So yeah. super subtle injury that is hard mm -hmm. to see. And again, that's probably a little advanced for today, but a very important one. Go on. Oh, can, okay. We'll ask that question later. We're going to ask you a question about the um, standing x-rays at the break. Don't let us forget. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. And then uh, type C, as you can see, without getting too deeply into this, these are just obviously like the worst of the worst, just super unstable. These always need surgery. Um, I mean, this is like just complete disruption and uh, dislocation of the spine. Do you want to add anything to this? I don't, I don't think uh, yeah. This so just... again, like I said at the beginning, when we're working these up, you want to start from the very worst type of injury, rule it out before you go to the next. So this one, obviously, frankly, unstable. You got one bone moving on top of another. That <laughs> means that everything is disrupted. Your anterior column, your posterior column, your ligaments are disrupted. So that one goes to surgery immediately because there's always going to be canal compromise and likely cord injury. That's probably enough for that. Yeah. Um, the, the reason you may wonder why I operate on someone who's complete injury with, with, a, um, with a scan like this, right? Uh, so th there are good, there's good data to support the fact or the support um, the role of early surgical intervention in these patients uh, as a, a pretty significant portion of these patients do improve later on with surgical intervention versus those that are just treated conservatively. You majorly improve the patient's quality, even if they're paraplegic, as is probably the case with this patient here, you majorly improve their quality of life by, by reducing and, um, and, and f fixing the fracture as they are now able to sit upright, they can be transferred easily, uh, you know, they don't have any of the issues of this, like basically grossly unstable uh, spine. And then last but not least, you also reduce the incidence of delayed deterioration in these patients, because although this patient's paraplegic, they still have function of their arms, theoretically. And what happens is, is if you have like this fracture that doesn't heal well, and it's through arthrosis, and it's just kind of, um, you know, not healing the way it should, these patients can often develop delayed spinal cord tethering, they can develop a syrinx or stringomyelia, and then this can make them lose function in their arms later down the line. So that is something also to keep in mind in these patients is the reason to operate on them, okay? So, um, you know, you don't want to just say, oh, there's no point in operating on this patient. It's, it's a complete spinal cord injury that this is totally, you know, is a hopeless scenario. It's not a hopeless scenario. There, there are a lot of things you can do to help this patient surgically. Um, I think this is a little complicated. I don't think there's really much well, to get into here. this just shows what I'm seeing, the way yeah. you go. You start at the worst, yeah. rule things out as you go down. Is there translation? Yeah. No. You go there. Is there anterior or posterior tension management? No. You go down to the next one. Is it all yeah. the anterior column? Then it's A. And that's important. Very different. Usually less severe, although can be, but different type of injury. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.